Now, there's another group of patients sometimes will come when it's not really the neck pain so much, as I'm now getting terrible pain down my arm, and every time I look, it shoots down my arm. It might go to your thumb and index finger and they tingle, and that really has become very bad, or it came on pretty quickly and suddenly with a lot of neck pain, terrible arm pain. And it's often the arm pain is so bad, you almost want to have it cut off. And these are patients who often suffer a cervical disc protrusion, rather like somebody can have a bad slip disc in their lower back, and that causes vicious pain down the arm. And it usually settles, like sciatica, often settles down, but sometimes it doesn't. And it's either so acute it's causing damage, in which case we might consider surgery early. If it's not, but it's dragging on, not settling, then often surgery, if the nerve coming out of the spine is being pinched, surgery can really be dramatically good. But again, it needs clear clinical decision-making proper examination findings and the right history and the right scan findings. And if you get that combination, you get the right surgeon in the right environment, in the proper hospital where it's safe to do this surgery, and the, above all, the right, a good anaesthetist, because they've got to keep you alive and safe, and a good nursing team and good backup, then these operations can be really successful and dramatic. I've seen patients in agony, and the next day, completely better, the arm's completely fine, gone, if you're lucky. So some can be dramatic. So those patients often nowadays will either free the disc from behind if it's suitable, sometimes you can just do a little operation to make more room for the nerve, called a foraminotomy. A little bit more problematic because of the muscles in your neck, you've got to disturb them a little bit. And it doesn't treat the disc protrusion definitively, you're just trimming the disc a bit, a bit like we do for the lumbar discs. But in the neck, often we'll operate from the front because the access to the front of the neck is very easy. If I push my hands in there, I'm almost on my vertebrae of my neck. My carotid artery is one side, and my larynx and my gullet are the other side. And there's a plane down there, and we can dissect down there through a nice little incision in the skin grease. And they often heal very well if you do them properly. Uh, and then you're onto the anterior cervical column, the vertebrae, and you can see the disc and then remove the disc from the front away from the spinal cord and free the nerves. And if it's the spinal cord that's being pressed on, which is of course more serious, free the spinal cord. And then you're left with a gap where the disc was. And we usually trim the edges a bit and tidy it all up and it's all nice and you've got the lining over the spinal cord. You hope not to have gone through that so the fluid would leak, so we keep that intact. And the spinal cord is suddenly given room. You can below forwards. And then you've got the disc space and most of the time we'll replace that. And there are two main, three ways of doing that. Originally when I was training we used to always take bone from the hip and cut a piece of bone to fit where the disc was and cause a fusion there. The trouble was the hip pain was worse than the post-operative pain from the neck because there's very little muscle dissection. So it's not a very painful operation. But by taking the bone from the hip you could put it in and just keep the space of the disc and the vertebrae would fuse. That definitively takes that segment of the spine out of action for good. But I was very involved personally in development of what we call interbody fusion cages and I think I wrote the first pilot series with Nick Brook, my senior registrar at the time, using carbon fibre interbody fusion cages. And they were very successful and we realised that we could get rid of taking this bone from the hip and that avoided that pain and we found the results clinically were really just as good. And so now most of us have all moved to the, to the interbody fusion cages and I've done that all my career really since I started and did that in the early 90s and subsequent to that we've also had disc replacement. And disc replacement is really, I liken these things to spacers. You're putting a spacer where the disc was. One spacer is designed to try and encourage the vertebrae to fuse across, through it and around it, which they pretty effectively do most of the time. The other spacer is one designed to try and stop the fusion, but allow a little bit of movement within the spacer so you keep some movement of the segment. And that's what we mean by an arthroplasty. It's not really a new disc, it's not a living disc, but it's a spacer designed to maintain a little bit of movement. And they can be very effective and usually best for people with what I call a soft disc protrusion, younger patients, 
especially if they've got a bit of wear and tear at the level above. Because when we fuse the vertebrae, it tends to put a little bit of strain on the next discs. Because you've lost the movement where you might have had some. And therefore the next discs have to work a bit harder. And the movement, they actually show that they will move more after a fusion. So there's more strain, so there's more likelihood they might wear out a bit quicker than if you hadn't done the fusion. The trouble is, you've got to remember, often by the time we're treating patients with bad discs, the discs have already become very stiff. So trying to keep movements a bit stupid because it's already lost and restoring it may actually be worse than helpful. And it's not likely to make much difference. But in somebody where it's quite a biggish disc height, there's good movement. Personally, I still think the logic is, is there that the disc arthroplasty is perhaps better to go for. It's very few select patients I would tend personally to do that in. But some of them have had very good results and they have kept moving. And some of them will fuse round, but on the whole, the good modern ones tend to keep pretty good movement. Uh, what you don't want is too much movement, and I wouldn't strongly advise, and it's not recommended, these should be used when the cord is compressed. Because when the cord is being pinched, it's often wise to stop the movement as well. Because one thing the spinal cord, in fact all nerves hate, is if a nerve is pinched slowly and squashed, but there's no movement, nerves keep functioning remarkably well. But when you add a bit of movement across that compression, which we call entrapment, rather than just compression, it's entrapment, it's movement and compression. Nerves hate it, they hate it. And that's why people with carpal tunnel syndrome get the pain. The ligament across the nerve going to your hand is tight and they're still moving their wrist. And the two together is what we would call an entrapment neuropathy of the median nerve going in there to your hand. So they get always tingling in the hands at night. And they often sleep or they're sleeping in an odd position and there's movement, it can press on it and and wake up the hands tingling. So entrapment is a term I like in the spine because it, you've really got a spinal cord that is still movement, it's entrapped. And so then it may well be better to fuse the, the, the relevant segments than leave the movement. If the spine is of course very stiff and it's just chronically entrapped, you don't necessarily have to do a fusion at all, but it's all about freeing the spinal cord and giving it lots of room. And often those operations we do at the back of the spine because we can make much more room that way, removing the arches of the vertebra or lifting them up or whatever, different ways of skinning a cat. But essentially it's making room for the spinal cord and making sure the spine maintains reasonable stability and posture. So